as Molly said, I am a teacher, I'm a scholar, I'm a survivor, I'm not an organiser, um, and I'm very pleased to be in this space which brings together organisers and academics, but I'm also very mindful of some of the tensions around that as well, which we can certainly talk about um, in the questions. Um, I've been an activist but in circles very different to these. Um, and as Molly said in the introduction, it was kind of my own failed activism around sexual violence in universities that led me to abolition. Um, I'm at the very beginning of my journey with abolition feminism, unlike the other speakers and facilitators that you might hear from during these two days. Um, and I actually think that's why I'm here. Um, so to, to begin at the beginning, um, in a way and connect with other people who might be in a similar place, who might have signed up for this workshop um, for similar reasons. Um, so I'll definitely be teaching some of you to suck eggs and you can go and have a cup of tea while I'm talking, that's absolutely fine, I don't mind at all. Um, or you can stay and, and write things about me on the feedback sheet, <laughs> that's also fine, um, I don't mind. Um, but if you're happy to stay and listen for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm very grateful and I'm really honored um, to be opening this workshop today. Um, I've been heavily influenced in my journey to abolition by both Abolitionist Futures and Read and Resist. And I've drawn on their experience and wisdom many times already, and I'm sure I'll continue to do that in the future. I'm thrilled as well and quite intimidating to be intimidated to be sharing a platform with Lola, with Ruth, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and with Craig Gilmore. Um, what amazing company um, to be in. So I came to abolition from the heart of white feminism, really, which is the movement against campus sexual violence in the UK, which was powered by extremely angry white feminists, um, although some of the key student activists were not um, and were women of colour. And I want to mention Sis Siswana Amoa at this point, who I worked closely with for many years. So I was involved in the movement from 2006 to 2018, um, fighting to influence mainstream policy and practice. I supported the National Union of Students with the first national survey of violence against women students. I co-authored the NUS report on lad culture and I joined the subsequent task force on that issue. Um, I sat down with Equality Challenge Unit and Universities UK who are kind of pseudo government bodies. Uh, I co-led a pan-European project developing disclosure training for university staff and we also co-created guidance on more intersectional training approaches. I co-founded the Changing University Cultures Collective and through that worked intensively with four different institutions on how their cultures framed bullying, harassment and violence before we realised that we were what Audrey Lord would call the master's tools. Uh, all this work started pre-financial crisis, pre-austerity, pre-Black Lives Matter, pre-Me Too, before the current far right resurgence and culture wars and before COVID-19. And all these were radicalizing forces for me, as was the financialization of universities with its constant pressure to expand. So during my time as an academic, there's been mass casualization of academic labor and significant cuts to salaries and pension, pensions, which has prompted revived trade union activity. So since 2018, we've had a series of strikes which have put us in company with bus and rail workers, cleaners, teachers, nurses and doctors, postal workers, and others who've withdrawn their labor. But all of this is set against rampant individualism and careerism in the neoliberal university. So activism is commodified as part of scholarly brands or consultancies. Um, there are also attempts to co-opt that activism made by institutions themselves. There are growing hierarchies, both within academia as some scholars develop their brands and also between us and the administrative and support staff who do the housework of the university, but are often neglected and overlooked, including, including by those working on sexual violence issues. This context and this political economy informs my post hoc assessment of campus feminism in the UK, and it certainly informed my move towards abolition. So from 2006 till now, we've certainly achieved something in universities. We've got our voices heard. Uh, we've made space for other survivors to speak. 
We put pressure on university leaders to create policies, commission reports, implement training. We put the issue on the media agenda, sometimes in quite problematic ways. But the university policy fixes tended to be what Sarah Ahmed would call non-performative. So they didn't enact new realities, but they replaced them, allowing institutions not to do anything else. So our reports were used as answers to themselves, basically. Our training programs were moved online to be completed with just a few clicks. Our research was used to justify evidence-based tweaks and best practice that just stabilized the system. When we named and shamed individuals, that often just allowed universities to airbrush out those blemishes. We outsourced our harassers to other universities, the famous pass the harasser problem, and they also have dumped them on women in lower status, lower paid economic sectors, which to me is more like nimbyism than radical politics. So I now know that appealing to the university to protect, protect us from violence fundamentally misunderstands what it is. We've become clients of a system we should be trying to dismantle. And I think that goes for white feminism more generally as well. Abolitionist university studies understands education as key to the capitalist, colonial, modern world making project. It's a mode of primitive accumulation, which means that it hoards credentials and it uses them to sort us into stratified economic and social roles. As economic actors themselves, universities are central to flows of dispossession and accumulation. They've been built on enclosed and indigenous common lands and enriched by transatlantic slavery. And they're now deep in the rationalities and practices of privatization, outsourcing, downsizing, casualization. They have complex financial entanglements, including with the military industrial complex. So my question is how can the university protect us from violence when the university is violence itself? The university can't save us, it's what Audre Lorde would call the master's house. And a lot of terrible thinking has happened and continues to happen in this house. There are also spaces of <coughs> radical potential, what Moton and Harney call the undercommons, which means those of us who don't fit the institutional mold and who can create together if we can find each other and if we can survive. In these spaces, some of us have been quietly discussing our end game. So are we working towards a world where all the bad people are excluded or shut away? A world where we alone are safe at the expense of everyone else or a world without sexual violence? Other people are leaning further into the system. So Sharon Cowan and Vanessa Monroe identify a criminal justice drift or what M Mimi Kim would call a carceral creep in UK university responses to sexual violence, which emulates the legalistic model of the US. And this is despite the fact that criminal legal systems across the world have persistently failed to address sexual assault. In 2017, the viral iteration of Me Too also leaned in to the criminal legal system, despite the best efforts of Tarana Burke and other feminists of color. And coming so soon after the 2016 Black Lives Matter uprising, prompted by the murders of Philando Castile, Corin Gaines, Alton Sterling and others, it was hard not to notice the fundamental hypocrisy at the heart of white feminism. So we're happy to say Black Lives Matter while we invest our hopes into the very systems that produce black demise. And it was during Me Too that I started to write about marginalized groups as collateral damage of the white feminist war machine. I also started to explore continuities between mainstream white feminism, more reactionary forms of trans and sex worker exclusionary feminism, and the far right ideologies that were rapidly gathering pace. So the focus on the dangerous other the policing of borders and a will to power that we find easy to spot in white men, but which in white feminism is usually exercised by proxy through the punitive state or institution. Safety in white feminism is often pursued to the detriment of liberation. And as Mona al Tahawi says, I don't want to be protected, I want to be free. Centering protection rather than freedom makes us cling to men who both reserve the right to abuse and kill us themselves and use us as a pretext for perpetrating other forms of abuse. 
In 2021, after Sarah Everard was raped and murdered by serving Metropolitan Police Officer Wayne Cousins, mainstream feminist demands called for expanded police powers, the criminalization of street harassment and for misogyny to become a hate crime. And I started to theorize white feminist politics as a macro version of what Susan Griffin called the patriarchal protection racket, which is the threat of stranger rape that pushes us into the arms of the husbands and partners who are more likely to abuse us. So this is the white feminist cycle, the acts and threats of sexual violence that keep us in our place, that make us docile subjects of capitalism, also drive us into the arms of the carceral state and enable more violence in the service of capitalist accumulation. Fear disciplines us and then is used by power to discipline or destroy those we are taught to fear. And none of it keeps us safe. So understanding this makes abolition irresistible, as Mariam Carver would say. In their book, Abolition Feminism Now, Angela Davis, Gina Dent, Erica Miners and Beth Ritchie define abolition feminism as feminism that is actually focused on ending gender violence in all its forms. So what does this mean? The phrase all its forms recognizes that state violence is gender violence, that police violence is violence against women. It acknowledges that pincer movement between interpersonal and state violence that traps us in the system. It also includes the violence of war and occupation, the violence of borders and violence against the planet. I theorize heteropatriarchy and racial capitalism as intersecting systems that pivot on sexual violence. Sexual violence extracts free social reproduction. So Gerda Lerner argues that patriarchy developed alongside organized agriculture in the Neolithic period when we began to accumulate rather than merely to survive, when groups began to war with each other, and when women's reproductive capacities became an economic resource. Gender violence in the form of witch hunting was also central to the violent imposition of racial capitalism in the early modern period. As Silvia Federici shows, women's power had to be suppressed in order to create by force the sphere of unpaid reproductive labor that modern capitalism depends on. Colonial capitalism counterposed widespread acts of sexual violence against indigenous and enslaved people and the concept of the sexually dangerous savage as modes of terror and control. And the pretext of protecting white women still constructs communities, cultures and nations as violent to justify border regimes and military industrial projects and to dispose of unwanted populations on local, national and global scales. Expecting these death-making systems to keep us safe is not just futile, not just an attempt to end violence with violence, but a trap set to keep us under control. Racial capitalism requires us to want, to dominate, to outsource and to dispose. And sexual violence is fundamental to all of these dynamics. And the idea of sexual danger underpins the criminalization of social problems, the production of disposable classes, and the fortification of borders to keep the others out. Whether knowingly or not, white feminism is an accomplice to this, focused on injury and remedy, and deeply attached to what Paula Rojas calls the cops in our heads. Stuart Hall taught us that author authoritarian populism achieves consent through protection. And even on the brink of fascism, some white feminists are still appealing to authority to save us. What abolition tells us is that if we want a world free of violence, we need to build, build it ourselves. The current mainstreaming of abolition, especially in the academy and in the media, tends to erase its roots in black feminism and other feminisms of color. Abolition feminism grew out of a long tradition of black women's resistance against interlocking oppressions and a multi-dimensional approach to sexual violence which reflected the fact that allegations of rape have been tools of white supremacy. So from <clears throat> Ida B. Wells Barnett's campaigns against lynching, to the work of Rosa Parks and other civil <clears throat> rights activists, <clears throat> to the formation of critical resistance and insight in the late 1990s and early 2000s, 
black feminists fighting sexual violence have refused to ignore the racist use of allegations and imputations of rape and the role of sexual violence in legitimating death-making institutions such as prisons and police. Abolition feminism, although it might not have gone by that name, can also claim a lineage from indigenous and decolonial movements across the world. First Nations and Native American feminists, Latin American, South Asian and African feminists and others have combined gender analysis with analysis of colonial violence and genocide. They've theorized how what Ligonis calls the coloniality of gender was dependent on sexual violence. In other words, the bodies of indigenous people were sexually violated by colonizers and also seen as polluted with sexual sin and imagined as sexual threats. They've named and opposed the appropriation of feminism for colonial ends, what Spivak calls white men saving brown women from brown men. These feminisms situate sexual violence and state violence as one and the same encapsulated recently by the Chilean feminist slogan, the rapist in your path, intended to mimic an old phrase portraying the police as the friend in question. This long history shapes abolition feminism's relationship to time. So neoliberal capitalism is full of haste, pressure for productivity and demands for instant fixes off the shelf. Abolition feminism encourages us to locate ourselves in deep time, understanding that it took centuries to build racial capitalism and it may, might take just as long or longer to dismantle it and build something better. I recently heard the phrase cathedral politics, which is perhaps too ostentatious, too finite, too teleological and as a metaphor for abolition, but it's a way of describing careful, steady work towards a future we almost certainly won't live to see. I spent part of my childhood in Bristol, a city with a cathedral that was started in 1218 and not finished till 1905. And I find this idea strange, strangely hopeful. It may, means that we can build something amazing if we all do our own small part. Lamble says that abolition is about what we build in the here and now to make the future possible. It's an ongoing and everyday practice, a political philosophy and a way of life. But locating our better worlds in deep time doesn't mean we can't change this world for the better in the meantime, we absolutely urgently must. Our meantime is a time of political and economic crisis. And although modes of social control are reasserting themselves in all kinds of ways, there are also opportunities everywhere. As Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us, structures change in crisis times. This can occur through major uprisings and through what Molly Ackhurst calls everyday disruptions, which are just as powerful and which help us to prefigure the future now. On a recent visit to Durham Cathedral, which took over 400 years to finish, I lit a candle for my grandmother who died during the pandemic. In her 98 years of life, Beatrice Annie Walker had seen drastic changes in the world for the worse and for the better. And while we build cathedrals for our descendants, we must light candles for each other. Abolition is both a future tense and a present tense politics of care. Care isn't easy in a narcissistic, stingy, neoliberal culture. And for white feminists being asked to care may evoke the compelled care that we've historically opposed. The white feminist movements I've been part of have tended to eschew care. Nasty women are fueled by rage. And rage on behalf of the self, which often seeks revenge, is perhaps seen as feminist because in the bourgeois nuclear family, the female self is diminished, diminished and denied. In racial capitalism, care can be violence because it's compelled, forced, outsourced and unevenly distributed and withheld from those who need it most. But care is also at the heart of the alternatives that we need. Flick and Fab have described how the COVID pandemic prompted a revaluation of care and caring labor. And although our claps for carers were mostly performative, there's ongoing solidarity with striking nurses, refuse, rail and postal workers and others that we need to hang on to and to build. 
And this extends out from the heart of abolition feminism, which is care for survivors and care for our incarcerated comrades. There's no conflict here, and not just because so many incarcerated people are survivors themselves. Care is done for and with other people. As Mariam Carver says, everything worth worthwhile is done with other people. Um, at this point, I want to return to the political economy of the campus, though, which works against collectivity and care in a number of ways. So I, and maybe some of you, many of you, work in an environment in which instead of looking after each other, we're encouraged to compete to become figureheads and stars. In the social sciences and humanities, this often involves inserting ourselves into grassroots spaces and extracting knowledge to advance and enrich ourselves. And I can see this happening as abolition moves further into the mainstream, mainstream and we have to guard against it. In reality, the role of the scholar is quite simple. Ruth Lawson Gilmore recently encapsulated it when she said, we're here to learn how things work and share that learning in the best way we can. It's also just as important for us to leverage our institutional connections to support grassroots organizing with funding and resources, which spaces like this can help to facilitate. And then through our teaching and our curricula, we can create the preconditions for organizing to take place. If it's possible to have a pedagogic agenda in the neoliberal university, this will come from the undercommons. And if universities and students had no role to play in radical movements, the right wing would not be attacking us so consistently and so well. But we are just one part of a much larger struggle. As part of a larger struggle, we can be more confident of our place. We don't have to either have all the answers or solve all the problems. All we have to do is our part. I often worry that I'm not doing enough. I sit in a kind of fraught space between the narcissism and grandiose grandiosity of both whiteness and academia and the self-doubt and compulsive caring of somebody with a background of abuse. So I want to end with something I find quite reassuring, which is the first stanza of Revolutionary Letter 2 by feminist poet Diane de Prima. The value of an individual life, a credo they taught us to instill fear, and in action, you only live once. A fog on our eyes, we are endless as the sea, not separate, we die a million times a day. We are born a million times, each breath, life and death. Get up, put on your shoes, get started, someone will finish. And I'm going to finish there. Um, I'm very happy to take questions, but I also think what would be really nice would be to yield the floor to some of you to hear about how you came to abolition or if you're completely new to it, why you signed up for this workshop today. Um, so I don't know whether I should hand back to you, Molly, or whether we should just throw it open um, for people to ask things. Um, maybe if people have questions or um, want to comment on the, the kind of refrain you just posed, you can either pop your hand up or just pop in the chat, whatever feels best for anyone. Or tell me your stories. I'd really like to hear your stories. Can you hear the banging, by the way? It's yeah. really loud. It's really loud. I mean, while people are mulling, I have a question, which um, was you positioned revenge as kind of, I guess, carceral, I guess. And I think I so understand that. Um, and I, but I wonder if you feel that kind of the imaginative place of revenge can ever be a place that we can sit with care with mm. survivors and the power of kind of imaginative revenge making, I mm. guess. I so think we can, I do. I mean, I think, um... Maybe there's maybe there's a distinction between revenge as a feeling, as an emotion, and revenge as a policy, um, which should be made here, because I think revenge is so natural. It's so natural to have feelings of revenge, and it's healthy in some ways to have feelings of revenge. It kind of puts the blame where it belongs, doesn't it? Um, which is a counterpoint to the self-blame that so many survivors um, seem to feel. And I do think that one of the challenges for 
doing abolitionist thinking or abolitionist work is how to hold those desires for revenge um, and how to challenge, channel them in a, in a kind of healing and a healthy way, while at the same time not making policy based on them. So, yeah, I do. I think that, you know, we do. We need an outlet, don't we, for people's revenge, people's punitive fantasies, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, such a good question. We've got a question from Silvana in the chat. It says, thanks a lot, Alison, you've talked about care, but there are some feminist critiques you consider this could lead us back to essentialism or naturalizing care as something feminine or feminized. What is your understanding of care in the context of a decolonial critique? And how does it differ, for instance, from Carol Gilligan's ethics of care? Yeah, such a good question. Thanks, Silvana. I can't see you, but hello. Um, oh, hi, there you are. Sorry, there's lots of faces on my on my screen. Yeah, I would never want to pass myself off as a decolonial thinker um, because I'm not I'm not qualified to, to say that about myself. But I do um, I, I understand the point about the kind of essentialist nature of our concepts of care. And I think that I've gone back and forth on this so many times. But also what I've kind of gone back and forth on is why is it that white feminism has such a sticking point around around care um either essentializing it as part of the female body or completely rejecting it and, and kind of making it a point of pride to be nasty which um a lot of the trans exclusionary feminists seem to do at the moment and how that differs from black feminisms decolonial feminisms other feminisms of color which seem to center care in a much less problematic way um, and i think that's probably something to do with the kind of centrality of the bourgeois white nuclear family and its roles to the white feminist framework um, i do think that it can be difficult to have a politics focused on care without loading extra work onto the people that are normally the caregivers but I also think that we have to try and we have to kind of work with that because care is tricky, but I think it's 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 essential. Um, I don't know whether you've read the Care Manifesto, um, which came out just after COVID by the Care Collective, but they engage really nicely with some of this. Um, oh, V's put something in the chat. Yes, plus care can be weaponized just for their own good. Absolutely. Um, which can be weaponized against trans youth. Um, they don't know what they're doing or the Nordic model of sex industry regulation, which is yes, we're criminalizing you for your own good um, because we want to save you. Absolutely. And I think we have to kind of, I mean, for me as well, something about abolition feminism is about being able to sit in the mess and not require kind of the binary concepts or the very neat theorizing of some other perspectives um, because all of this is really messy it is really complicated and we don't have the perfect concepts or the perfect frameworks and we have to sort of work through that together in a way um, yeah um raven you've got your hand up Yes, hi, thank you. Um, Allison, I think after I read your latest book, I exhaled for the first time in a really, really long time because it kind of feels like when you live this resistance, your life is resistance, that sometimes it's just, you can't even put into words what you're going through. And I just love the theorizing around um, abolition feminism. And I kind of see it because I work with sex workers in particular, I, I really loved how sex workers are included as part of calling out the violence of some feminisms. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that this is a pathway for us to expose that the oppression that um, women sex workers face at the hands of other women and also the systemic oppression and all the other intersectional violence. But I'm, I'm just I'm just thankful to be here. I see that V's here, um, which is she's also someone in my network. So I'm just really happy to find a place that might might just feel like home. So I appreciate um, what you, the work that you're doing. Oh, that's so lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I have to say as well that I learned so much about feminism from sex workers and from sex workers' rights organizations. Um, and I think that that was probably the start of my epiphany about 
femi white feminism was seeing some of the violence that was enacted, enacted on social media against sex workers who were trying to speak up for themselves and for the for their own labor rights. And I should really shout out to um, Molly Smith and Juno Mack, um, who taught me so much about a different way of doing feminism. Um, so yes, thank you so much, Raven. That's, that's lovely. And it's lovely to see you, if not meet you in person. I wonder, oh, Lola, you've got your hand up. I was gonna say, I wonder if there are any more questions and your hand is up. Hello, um, I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you so much um, for that, Alison. I was, I, this might be a bit of a, like a bungled question, but I wondered what you thought about the fact that there is a kind of like liberal economy now for books about like anti-racism or books that kind of critique whiteness that really divorce it from like capital and from, I guess, like the profit motive and like racial capitalism. And I, I sometimes I feel like there's a tendency within like feminist spaces to be benevolent either way. So to, to either think of like uh, black feminism and feminism of color with a kind of like almighty like deference mm. or to, to, yeah, to go like the, in the other direction as well. And I'm interested in for you, your thoughts on understanding abolition feminism and feminism in general uh, in general as through a kind of comradely orientation so mm. something we do for each other because we are responsible for one another and and mm. something that we do not in spite of our difference but because it because of it if that makes sense yeah does that make sense yeah it does make sense hi lola by the way <laughs> lovely Hello. to hear your voice um yeah i think um the first part of your question I was a little bit, um, what's the word? I don't know. I don't know what the word is. Not disappointed, that's the wrong word for it, but my book came out and around the same time, a lot of other books came out focused on white feminism. Um, many of them very, very good, but it does, did seem that at that point and in response to the kind of Black Lives Matter uprisings during the pandemic, there was a kind of industry developing around examining whiteness, examining white feminism, and also locating the answer to that problem in white people and white women kind of engaging in self-reflection and apologizing for ourselves and, and all the rest of it. Um, and I would never want to be part of that kind of industry. Um, I, yeah, I, I kind of, I'm very wary of being included in that sort of canon, but also I um, am very careful now about sort of wanting my words not to be misinterpreted because I don't want anybody to think that that's what I'm saying um, and that the answer is kind of white sort of navel gazing and self-reflection. So that's the, the first part. Um, and I do, I really, and I also agree that there is a tendency to kind of situate the sort of, magical black feminism as the answer to white feminist problems, which is also problematic in itself. I really like Jennifer Nash's work on intersectionality as well, and some of the ways that that has been kind of appropriated, but also some of the battles over that that have gone on within academia, which sort of missed the point. Um, and I do think that the answer to all of this is kind of move, moving forward together in a comradely way. Um, I find it quite difficult to find the balance, I guess, between making the necessary critiques of what goes on in mainstream feminist spaces and making the space for us to have these conversations together about ways forward. Um, and I think that spaces like this are probably really, really helpful for everybody to get together and to have a safe space where there's no such thing as a silly question and people who are new to something and people who are more experienced can can come together because I do think there's a tendency to dismiss people who are wanting to do something maybe a bit differently or a bit new um, and sort of there's a gatekeeping sometimes around more radical forms of politics which I don't think is helpful um, and I really like Mariam Carber's approach to this which is come on in you know come on in put the kettle on, pick up a pen or, or whatever, and um, let's all muck in together. So I, 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 I understand what you're guessing at, Lola. I don't know whether I've got an answer. I mean, it, I don't think it was a bungled question, but I think this might be a bungled answer in terms of, yes, these are really important tensions um, 
and there were similar tensions to the tensions around kind of academia and organizing and the value of education and scholarship to organizing but also the place of that um, within these broader movements and academics not overreaching but also helping where we can um, I think there's there's lots of tensions to be sort of worked out there um, yeah so I don't I don't think that fully answered your question but I appreciate you raising some of these issues no I, I think I, I definitely think it did and also if I could just respond I feel like it has something to do maybe with understanding where the site of struggle is yes. and I think like positioning like making sure that that site of struggle is clear making sure that that's not necessarily the the institution or the violence against women sector or whatever like yes. I think that's how you like create maybe a more horizontal mm. understanding of like why we do the work that we do I'm not sure but that was just what came to mind <clears throat> yeah I think that's right I think that's absolutely right and I think sometimes we sort of misplace the site of struggle maybe because it's easier or maybe because it sort of fills a need for us at that particular time um so I think that's a really helpful way of putting it Are there any other? Oh, Lara's got Lara's got her hand up. You're on mute, Lara. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, Alison. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Hi. Um, I guess my question is coming from my own experience of being from Mexico, but working at a UK Global North University and the tension between trying to be an actor or, or you know, trying to be an activist both in the UK and supporting um, you know, my community back home. And I often find in not only in activist spaces, but overwhelmingly in universities, um, there's this kind of expectation that like, I think how knowledge and activism flows is like very much concentrated in the global North in like English speaking communities even when we're talking about like racially minoritized communities, when we're talking about evolution, it's often from like the US or UK based. And mm. I feel that kind of that international solidarity, which is, you know, um, Angela Davis and Ruth Gilmore talk about uh, like that international solidarity is needed because of the way in which racial capitalism, the prison industrial complex, you know, borders, uh, technology, surveillance, all of this. And I feel sometimes a lot of the conversations that are just happening here have been happening like across the global South, um, whether it's the Zapatistas or like indigenous feminism. Um, so yeah, I guess it's kind of how do we kind of because there's this expectation that as Global South people, we have to kind of engage in these conversations from like to the Global North, but it doesn't mm. often happen. And a lot of it is also about language as well. Like we're expected yes. to be bilingual, trilingual, you know, all of this, but it's not. Yeah. So I guess, you know, how can we, you know, you know, maneuver against uh, these, these tensions, uh, I guess. There's no right answer, but it would be interesting to to hear what people, you know, maybe people have ideas on how they've done it as well. Sorry for the rambling, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I, I'm not an expert on, on this at all. Um, and I know that that's been a weakness in, in my work in the past, a really big, big weakness and continues to be, although I'm trying to do something about that now. Um, I mean, I do think that there are ways to connect up now that there haven't been in the past, and maybe we, especially through technology and maybe we aren't making the most of those as much as we could um i also agree that a lot of the discourse around abolition sort of locates it um especially in north america when actually it, you know these these feminisms have a much longer history coming from all different parts of the world um i don't i don't yeah i don't know whether anybody else has any ideas or thoughts on that on how we how we can kind of make more of these connections how we can learn from each other how we can develop more of these solidarities that that Lola was talking about as well. I wonder if maybe some of our speakers throughout the day will also be able to speak to some of these kind of more broad and open questions. And I see some of the speakers nodding, which is reassuring. <laughs> um, 
but I think we're about to shift into a break so with before we do so just thank you so much for that Alison and for answering everyone's questions with such warmth and generosity and I can see the virtual clapping which always just feels weird but it's oh. <laughs> nonetheless. Thanks, um, Mike. 